Hello, uh, I'm here with Cecilia Atterwall from Ericsson to talk about 5G. Um, I say here, I'm actually at the Light Reading Video Studio in London while Cecilia is at Schiester uh, in Stockholm where, where the Ericsson headquarters are. Um, Cecilia, great to, great to see you today. Um, we have about a year and a half of commercial 5G service now around the world. I know Ericsson's involved in a lot of those networks. How would you gauge progress to date? I think we're at an exciting time in the progress of the 5G uh, deployments. So after these one and a half years, we see that 100 operators have launched 5G around the world. At this point in time, uh, the 5G momentum is gathering and we forecast up to 200 million 5G consumers by the end of this year. That's a, that's a great threshold, 100, 100 networks uh, launched. Um, one of the things I've seen from, sort of, I guess, my personal experience, and I think there's actually data to show it up, is how as these networks have been um, deployed, the operators are consistently improving them. So you have more coverage, you have infill, and the actual user experience is just getting better and better as we go on. I think that's a, that's a, a very positive point. Um, I also wanted to ask you, though, about the, um, the business impact. Have we seen 5G actually kind of feed through into to the operator sort of business success yet? So I mentioned the 100 operators who have launched 5G and, and Ericsson is actually supporting 60 of those. So we have a lot of good insight into how they're building their networks and deploying their services. But across those 100 operators, we can also see that they have taken steps to put the new uh, 5G offerings in place, which also gives them a little bit more revenue potential back. So two thirds of, of the operators who have launched 5G, pri uh, 5G price plans actually have a premium to that price plan, which is also matching the better consumer experience that we see out there. So not only are the consumers using actually a lot more data, about two to three times that of, of LTE users, but obviously they're also getting a better experience, which they are ready to, to then pay more for. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how that sort of feeds through into the into the wider market, I guess. I mean, I was lucky enough, I took one of these uh, all-in big bundle plans for 5G, and I've got to say, it's, it's fantastic. We'll see how that pushes through uh, into, into, the, into the wider market. Now, um, things are looking great, no doubt. One thing I did want to uh, uh, bring up with you, though, is, is coverage. You know, everyone's focused on this. The story of mobile is that coverage is king. Um, how can we expect this to change you know, through the rest of 2020, but I guess in 21, 22 years to come. I think you're exactly right there, Gabriel. It's like those 100 operators who launched. Many of them wanted to get out there and have a great offering for their early users. But now it's all about building the coverage and the momentum across the wider consumer base. So to do that, obviously, you need to ensure the coverage. So in the early days, and to ensure you get the maximum return on your investment, any operator working with Ericsson would be looking to build with precision. Another way to look at that is to understand what are the primary use places. So not only to think about the use cases, but actually the use places. Where would consumers specifically want to be to have that great 5D experience and build for that? But then, of course, to ensure the wider coverage, you could tap into other things like your existing LTE spectrum on the low bands. And with the functionality such as Ericsson Spectrum sharing, you can actually ensure uh, the wide coverage of, of, your, of your country. And to give one example of that, we had Vodafone SIG launching and then only within three months ensuring population coverage of 90% of in the Netherlands. Yeah, I really love that term, uh, use places. I think it kind of speaks very well to you know, demand patterns you see in mobile networks where actually you know, usage is generated, the services people want to use. I'm looking forward to operators being able to kind of uh, adapt to that, but also give every subscriber or nearly every subscriber a brilliant experience as well. Um, picking up your, your point there on the, on the low band, whether you do that with spectrum sharing or fresh spectrum, can you talk a bit about how you actually integrate that then with, with mid band or high band? Exactly. So now with the added opportunities to build uh, for with mid band and millimeter wave, you of course can tap into the better capacity that those bands would enable. But you also have the inherent uh, problem of the less coverage that you get with those higher frequency bands. And to come to terms with that one, 
things like carrier aggregation and uplink booster would be key functionality to, to really get the coverage to, to, to its full. Okay, good stuff. So how do, uh, tell us how uh, better uplink performance and carrier aggregation, what, what does that actually mean in, in practice? So um, starting with uplink booster, that can actually double the coverage with that functionality into the networks. And then on top of that one, if you add carrier aggregation, you'd, you could get another 25% coverage on top. Okay, uh, good stuff. Other thing I wanted to, to talk to you about is um, any insight you have into 5G devices as we go through into fourth quarter, the, the holiday quarter as we call it. That's an exciting area, isn't it? It's all about the devices, right? So at this point in time, with what I mentioned before, up to 200 million 5G users by the end of the year, we actually see that multitude of devices now coming into the market with more attractive price points, but also better functionality. And as a company, we have been working with all the six major chipset vendors to put this in place, also uh, ensuring the interoperability and testing to have everything working with the device manufacturers themselves. It's really amazing, actually, how this how this ecosystem of chipset and, and 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 device manufacturers is moving so quickly on such cycles, and then of course all the interop uh, with the network side. Of course, and then you could also see that collaboration has ensured uh, the better capabilities of the chipsets themselves. So what we are looking at now is uh, the, the, that we can provide uh, support for standalone 5G uh, carrier aggregation, as well as the much better battery performance of the devices coming out into the market. Yeah, it's interesting how those features you mentioned earlier actually have a, have a dependency on, on the device and, and so forth there. Um, very good. So I wanted to, to close up. We talked about uh, 5G being very good for consumer. We get fast downlink speeds and so forth. Um, what about extension into the enterprise? When do you see that becoming, I guess, more of a focus and more of a business impact for the industry? Well, as you said, the majority of the services out there offered are actually targeting consumers. But now we see 5G happening also for industries and business. And just to mention one example, the recent launch of the new Mercedes-Benz factory that had ensured 5G coverage from day one. Uh, we provided that together with Telefonica to the benefit of Mercedes-Benz production and to really ensure the more efficiency and flexibility throughout their production site. Uh, it's a, 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 a good example, I guess, of a, of a use place, a, a, a specialist use place, I guess we could say, and use case. Use place for Mercedes-Benz in this case. Yeah. Um, Cecilia, great to talk to you. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Gabriel, and thanks all for listening.